Ladies and gentlemen, we got a very special treat today in this new series, which is an extension of the Macro Dragon. We're going to call this Dragon. And we have uh, one of a kind, at least in my viewpoint, uh, hedge fund manager out here in the Asia Pacific by the name of Ashpin Murthy. He's a co-founder and CIO of AVM Global Opportunity, a macro fund. And during this conversation, we will obviously get the background on Ashvin and the fund, but we'll also talk about some of the misconceptions in the hedge fund and investing space, asset allocation as a whole, and then of course, come down and see what is top of his mind, currently where we are with the US elections coming through, the liquidity regime that we're in, the kind of post-COVID world that we still are in, and maybe any high conviction thoughts he may have for 2021. Ashvin, glad we're finally getting to do this. It's been, a, it's been a while in the making. That's right. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. 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 So I thought we'd maybe just kick it off rather than the, the usual background and going straight into the hedge fund, uh, you know, um, and the story. Why don't we start off with, I think, some of kind of the main misconceptions that, you know, you've come across in the hedge fund and kind of investing space? Um, I think one thing that comes to mind is when I speak to investors, um, they feel that hedge funds are, gen are risky investments, right? The term hedge fund to them means I'm taking a lot of risk, there could be a lot of drawdowns. I think the hedge fund universe is actually quite big, so you can invest in a wide, wide range of strategies, it could be credit, equity, macro, and you can also choose the risk profile that you want. So if you want a high octane hedge fund, you can choose that, but if you want something with lower volatility, steadier returns, you can choose that as well. And many of these hedge funds are actually less risky than your traditional equity or bond investments. Would you agree that uh, there's also still a bit of that 2 and 20 paying someone for the privilege of them to underperform on your assets that uh, is, you know, maybe potentially true for a segment of the hedge fund space, like the bigger ones potentially? Yeah, okay. So then I know a lot of people have been complaining about underperformance with high fees. Unfortunately, I think that pertains more to the long-only hedge, equity hedge funds that are benchmarked to the S&P or some other equity benchmark, mm -hmm. right? And it is true, over the last 10, 20 years, they have underperformed broadly as a, as a group uh, versus the benchmark. But that's a big, as we just mentioned just now, you've got credit hedge funds, you've got macro hedge funds, yeah. which are different. And you know that underperformance isn't really true. And um, I guess, I'm in the global macro space. In that space, like performance has been a mixed bag, I'd say, over the last five to 10 years. Yeah. Um, you have the traditional macro hedge funds, some of the bigger ones who, who thrive on high volatility. So they need events. And we had a period of very low volatility in the last decade, sure. right? Coming into 2018. Yeah. So they might have underperformed, but over the last three years, they've done pretty well. Okay. And yeah. then you have the systematic guys yeah. who are the flip side. They do really well when vols are low. Right, so they did a, they had a really good run till 2018, and they've been struggling recently. And I think we've seen some of the big names sort of struggle because the volatil volatility regime has changed. And then you've got the other guys, which is a growing segment, I think, uh, who try to make money throughout the cycle. Right, so it's a slightly lower. They're looking for a higher risk-adjusted returns. Yeah. That's a, that's a metric they follow. And to do that, you need to bang out consistent returns through the cycle. So your, your strategy has to be able to perform in all the different regimes. And I think that's probably going to be a segment of the hedge fund space, which is going to grow. Okay. A lot to delve into uh, off of that. But, um, you know, just while we're at it, so for some of the people listening, and maybe more just traditionally it's equity specialists, but then also maybe some people with bond backgrounds or currency or, or commodity backgrounds, What's your definition of macro when you're explaining it to uh, one of your four kids uh, at home on, on what dad does? Yeah, I think um, I have to do that quite often. Yeah. But um, I think macro to me, I mean, so my background, I used to trade FX and rates. But macro to me is taking a view on the global economy and macroeconomic trends and trying to express that, those trends via the financial markets. And generally, that involves trading a lot of FX and interest rates mm -hmm. because those products are heavily driven by macroeconomic trends. So, you know, things like growth, inflation, liquidity, fiscal policy, these are some of the bigger ones. But all these things drive the prices in FX and interest rates because they're linked to government policy. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think for the traditional equity person who is long only, there's a, you know, in equity and credit, there's a lot more 
I would say, company-specific risk within the instruments. Um, at commodities, it is quite macro, but it has a demand and supply element to it. Whereas with FX and bo government bonds or interest rates, it's, it's primarily driven by all the macroeconomic indicators we follow on a daily basis. Okay. And um, if you, again, still on this kind of topic of, of, of you know, misconception, so to speak, you know, one of the ones I tend to come up with is where I feel that investors tend to look at hedge funds, first of all, almost like exclusively. Like I'm either running my money myself or I'm giving it all to someone else, right? Uh, and just like not really having an appreciation. And by the way, this finance people are actually the worst I tend to find at this, right? <laughs> but not really having an appreciation for asset allocation, right? So at least from the way I think about it, if 100% is the wealth that you're putting to invest, maybe you have 30% in real estate, 50% you are directly doing yourself, whether that is discretionary or whether that's passive, and then maybe you have you know, remaining 20% to put into kind of hedge funds, private equity, VC. I just tend to find that people don't really think about it that way. And you know, and going back to your point, like for macro or for credit, it's also outsourcing what's not your expertise, mm -hmm. I would have thought, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, it's this layer cake of also diversification. So you're not just sitting there with 100 million in the fangs, but it's maybe 20 million in the fangs, which is probably still pretty concentrated. Yeah. Uh, and then you also have uh, it diversified across the street to people who are best to breed and what they kind of do, mm -hmm. right? Um, what have you tended to find is maybe the, the, the top one or two misunderstandings uh, in, uh, in, in asset allocation that you kind of come through? Um, I think the first thing is the concept that you have a balanced portfolio, right? Um, you know, when you construct a portfolio, generally you think that, you know, people have the 60-40, 70-30, sure. equities and bonds. Yeah. Um, generally, you think that one offsets the other, but you're gonna have events like the start of this year where, you know, everything sells off, Yeah. right? So that idea of a balanced portfolio, you just have to be careful and understand what the correlations are, right? Um, the other thing is, I think you gotta think about your liquidity needs when you come to alloc asset allocation, right? So. If you need liquidity more frequently, yeah. you need to have a higher allocation to a lower volatility bucket. If you're willing to not touch your money for 20 years or 30 years, perhaps you can put your money in a higher volatility bucket mm -hmm. because you can weather the drawdowns and the volatility. Right? So it's very personal. So I would say, you know, for a, someone who's looking for savings or trying to grow his earnings and needs to, needs to tap on it regularly, you probably want to have a high allocation to the lower volatility bucket which is fixed income or low volatility alternatives. Sure, sure, now it all makes, all makes sense. Um, and actually just on that, like I, I tend to find, I guess the traditional way that most people think about it is there's the kind of the growth bucket, there's the capital preservation bucket, and there's kind of the income bucket, right? Um, so I suppose if someone's looking at AVM, they would probably think, well, okay, that's definitely not the income bucket because I need a coupon or a dividend, like traditionally that's kind of the thought. Uh, would you agree or disagree or is there another way of maybe thinking that kind of through? Well, the, with AVM, the idea is to compound your returns, right? So if you, we're trying to generate steady returns through the cycle. So if you leave your money in there, it's making 10 to 15% and you keep compounding that, it adds up. But it still works for investors who want a coupon. All you have to do is take off a little bit, redeem a little bit of what you've invested every year, for example, if you wanted to redeem four or 5% as a coupon, you could do that, mm -hmm. and then you leave the rest invested. So when you're generating about 10 to 15%, what you'd get is you'll get that income stream of 5%, and then you'd start getting capital appreciation on whatever you leave behind. So it's a mix of both capital appreciation and dividend flow. Okay, so basically just from your allocation, you construct the cash flow that you need as an investor. That's right. Okay. Um, yeah, again, I just think it's something that's solely, solely very kind of very much missed. Um, but I love your point about also the capital lockup. Uh, for obviously PE and venture capital, they tend to have anything from five to seven to even 10 years, right, of where someone can't access the capital. And like anything, there's also pros and cons to that. So people are maybe not withdrawing their capital at the lows. Uh, for macro funds and maybe specifically for yours, how, how does it work from a liquidity perspective uh, for, for your investors? 
Um, so it's a monthly, it's monthly liquidity. So if you ever need cash, you just have to give us 30 days notice and you can redeem your funds. And I think that's why it's important for me to keep the volatility low because you never know when an investor needs cash. Sure. So when he redeems, he's not going to be, you know, he's not going to be confronted with a big shock. Okay. And uh, let's let's get a little bit more now into you know your background. So you know even before we get into into AVM, which I think is a really unique story, uh, you know, can you maybe give uh, some of our viewers and listeners a little bit of, of the backdrop on on how you came up in the business? Because I think it's it's a little bit maybe more unique uh, than you know the classic hedge fund out there that we tend to see that tends to be. European or American, Caucasian, Ivy League school, you know, and so on. So just interested in, in, in your angle. Um, yeah, I think actually, you know, growing up high school, I never thought I was going to be in finance. You know, I grew up in a family of engineers. Uh, I went off to a degree in France in um, studying engineering. Scholarship, if I recall correctly. That's right, I got a scholarship yeah. from the yeah. Singapore government. Um, and then when I was going to, about to graduate, I noticed a lot of engineers were moving into finance, and I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> so I decided to. You know, I ended up with an internship with yeah. uh, Goldman uh, two years before I graduated. Sure. And that was my first exposure to a trading floor. Okay. And you know, I really liked it. What were you doing? Uh, so we were on the fixed income division. So yeah. you know, we got exposure to all the different businesses. Uh, it ended up with a trading game, and that was my first time actually trading money with real money. And what year was this? This was 2002. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So actually almost getting ready to come out of the recession, I believe. Correct, yeah. correct. No, actually it was a tough time in the market. So yeah. that was perfect because yeah. my before that, you know, as a, most investors, you only know equities. And sure. equities were in a big bear market. Correct. And then I walk into this division where everyone's making money. <laughs> 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 they're trading FX, they're trading interest rates, they're sure. trading commodities. And I'm yeah. like... Oh, yeah. that's very interesting. There's asset classes out there. Correct, yeah. right? And, yeah. uh, you know, that was good exposure. And, um, yeah, I'd realized, you know, actually an engineer is just, just analytical mind. Yeah. And you're just putting it to work in a different asset class. Gotcha. And then, uh, so from the internship, you decided this was something you wanted to uh, get into? Yeah, I had to make sure. So I did a, a master's in financial engineering. I okay. went to Columbia. Yeah. Um, so that was more focused on derivatives, all the complex stuff that was you know, getting popular at the start of the 2000s, right, yeah. CDS, et cetera. Yeah. And yeah, what I was doing that, you know, just understanding the mechanics and why products work the way they do. Um, yeah, then I knew I just wanted to get into this industry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, what was your first, uh, I guess, uh, entry point? Uh, was it UBS? Yes, my first job in finance was UBS, yeah. but uh, actually I started my career at the Ministry of Finance in Singapore. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. So you've also done the government side, so to speak. Yeah. That's right, that's yeah. right. I spent a couple of years there. We're looking at regulatory policy in Singapore. Um, it was part of my scholarship when I, when I went to France. And, you know, after a couple of years, it was a great experience, but um, then I moved to UBS um, and where I spent about four years in Singapore okay. on the structured products desk. Yeah. Um, so that's where the, the quantitative background came, came in handy because you're dealing with a lot of uh, complex derivatives, structuring solutions for clients. Um, that was interesting and that was mainly FX and interest rates. Yeah. Got to see a whole bunch of people, see what people are trading outside, trying to understand how, actually that's where the cross asset um, experience started because you looked at the correlation between FX, interest rates, commodities, put things together. Yeah. You know, you start to understand how everything works. And I'm assuming when you're dealing with structured products, the concept of optionality is key, right? Uh, it's something that a lot of people just don't fully really appreciate. And as well, probability. That's right. And, you know, you, you tend to put together products which make sense. So you're not going to put together a product when options are expensive. You're going to put it when it's cheap. Sure. You know, you need to understand how these products move with each other. Yeah. And how you can extract value from them. And, you know, that's... As any macro trader will tell you, when you're running a portfolio, that is very important. You need yes. to just know how the moving parts work together. Sure, sure. Then how did you end up running um, options and, and trading desks? And I also believe you've done stints out of Singapore, right? Can you walk us through that? 
Yeah, so we left Singapore in 2010. So Vanessa and I, my wife and I, we left without kids. The V in AVM, I believe? That's right, right she's the V in AVM. Okay. Um, so we went to, I went to London where I was running a, an FX and interest rate portfolio. Um, actually, honestly, that was really, that's where I really built the foundation for my career in macro trading. It was looking at all the, it was basically a correlation book where I was looking at uh, dollar yen, interest rates, it, U.S. and European interest rates, and um, you know it was, you had to trade that actively. But not only that, you really needed to understand. You had to trade the correlation on a daily basis. Gotcha. And to do that, uh, you needed a quantitative background, yeah. but you also needed to have a good grasp on the macro trends, because dollar yen and interest rates are one of the biggest things that move with sure, macro sure, trends, sure, right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I spent a couple of years there. It was a good experience, and then um, I went on to something less exotic. Yeah. which was, uh, I went off to Zurich, yeah. where I was running the Emerging Markets uh, book, yeah. uh, looking at Asian FX options. Like, let's give it to the Singapore guy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah. And was that all uh, prop and also market making, or uh, both London and, and, and Zurich? Or? So in London, it was, it was primarily prop. Primary, yeah. And in uh, Zurich, it was a mix. Okay, yeah. gotcha. And then uh, that was fun in Zurich. Uh, so we had two kids in London. Yeah. When, Went to Zurich, then we moved on to Hong Kong, yeah. where I changed banks. I went to Natixis, and that's where I was running their currency options desk. Okay. Uh, mainly Asian, Asian, uh, Asian currencies. Had our third kid there, <laughs> but that was a that was a great experience because um, you know you really got to see a lot of clients with the big hedge funds in Asia. Yeah. And how these guys think, especially in the, through all the different regimes, because I'm I'm assuming then these were also through. Uh, obviously, GFC, Euro crisis, taper tantrum, all of these kind of key classic events, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and when the China blow up in 2015, so you went through a lot of, uh, you got to see how these guys trade, the liquidity they required, the flows, because you can have a good grasp of the macro, but it's also equally important to understand how the flows, because uh, the flows, because that's how you execute your trade. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, do you remember what, where you were on uh, Draghi's Whatever It Takes? Yes, I do actually. Um, I was in Zurich. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we were all shorting the euro. Okay. <laughs> right? And then it started to go up. Yeah. <laughs> and it never looked back. I still remember that because we were all trying to sell it and break 120 and just wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was also short, but I was short equities, but it ended up being the same thing. <laughs> so, fair enough. Um, and then, you, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting because the classic thing in this business for people who transcend or transfer over into the hedge fund side is you join already an established hedge fund and maybe you spin off. And that's, of course, even assuming that people can make the transition to running a book, right? There's a very big difference, I think, between an analyst and a PM. Uh, and then probably a CIO is even another kind of uh, level up. Um, why did you go the route that you did, uh, let's say, versus, let's say, going to, uh, you know, a pod shop and potentially having a lot more money to run um, in the beginning? And also, mm -hmm. let's be honest, uh, a lot less hassle, right? Yeah. Um, you know, during that period working in the different banks, different desks, I sort of built a framework where looking at how macro trends actually affect the prices of, like, the financial assets you trade. It took a while to build it, but you know it was pretty robust. It went through like 50 years of data. It sort of explained you you sort of tells you what sort of assets you need to invest in depending on where you are in the economic cycle, right? So that was good. So I had that framework in mind. So then I was deciding how I'm going to do this, and I I looked at asset allocators and I realized, you know, you some guys want to invest in equities because they want higher long-term returns. Yeah. And they don't mind taking a bit of volatility, like what we mentioned just now, or drawdowns. And then you have the fixed income investor who doesn't want any volatility, he wants less drawdowns, mm -hmm. but he doesn't mind taking lower returns. And using that macro framework when I was trading, I realized that you know we built something that can have the best of both worlds. Right? So I wanna, what we're doing right now is providing investors with bond-like volatility. So you know, pretty much five, six, eight, seven percent vol, yeah. minimal drawdowns, but the returns are they're equivalent to global equities. So I thought it was a unique strategy that I wanted to build on my own. Um, you know, it's good to start on your own, building a new business, it was exciting, uh, wife was supportive, and uh, you know, I think it's been growing quite nicely over the last four years, I kind of, and it's been an interesting experience because 
I didn't expect markets to be the way they are. When I said, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think you'd have got into macro if, uh, <laughs> if we knew this was going to be how it was going to unfold. But yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's been a uh, four years. It's been what a bull market, a bear market, a bull market, yes, a bear market, yeah. and then a bull market. Correct. I've correct. Ne never quite seen anything like that, right? Correct. Um, correct. So yeah, you know, I think seeing that strategy actually go through these crazy periods with the same amount of low vol and steady returns. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's room for a strategy like that. I'm not sure if it'd sit well within certain bigger outfits, but sure. it's something I want to build as a business. Sure, sure. And I think actually this is kind of the real test, right? As um, you can always find a hedge fund manager who he or she has, has done quite well in one regime and then the regime shifts and all of a sudden they're from hero to zero or by then they're five billion and they just sit there and collect the management fees, right? That's right. Um, but uh, but interesting interesting again on uh, on when you started, um, I think you know maybe we could just delve a little bit more into the the plumbing, and the nuts and bolts of of the firm. Uh, give us context on you know let's get the delta. You know why is AVM different from let's say uh, your traditional kind of hedge fund or or macro fund, however way you 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 see that. And maybe we can also talk a little bit more also about uh, your investment process. Uh, my understanding is you know, it's, it's discretionary, but there is also a systematic uh, element over it. Uh, I mean, we're not necessarily asking for secret sauce, but just you know, kind of context on, um, on, on what you've set up and what you're building. Right? Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of the, the investment process, maybe we can start with that, sure. right? Um, yeah, so I wanted to build something that was repeatable. Right, so it's a mix of fundamental and systematic. So your traditional macro manager usually would, you know, a top-down view. You look at some certain macro indicators like inflation and growth, and you say, okay, I think bonds are going to sell off or bonds are going to go up, and then you put on a trade. Uh, for me, that wasn't enough. I just needed a lot of data to back up, back up the ideas, because we're all human and we all have a bias. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You need to remove that. So for me, that the whole thing about with this strategy is removing the bias because that can really take away a lot of alpha unnecessarily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so what we do is we always start with a view and then we back it up with a lot of data. We look at all the different economic regimes over the past 50 years. We look at how these assets have behaved during these periods. And if that's true, then we put on a trade, right? So I think it's just, you know, I don't, I'm not sure all this data was available 20 years ago. Now it's available, so you might as well use it, sure. right? Uh, once we put that on, I think it's, uh, we've decided on a trade. Structuring the trade and managing the trade, it's completely automatic. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, build a system where you can trade around a core position. Yeah. So, you know, if I bought, just for example, if I bought Apple shares and I bought it at $100. Sure. When it goes to $90, I buy a little bit more. And when it goes to $110, I'd sell a little bit, sure. right, to take profit. You just you keep a core position and you trade around it. Yeah. And I mean, actually, that's just buying low and selling high. Yeah, right. That's true. Uh, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 yeah. it sounds easy, but it's really difficult to do. Yeah. Because when a share goes from a hundred to a ninety, you're thinking, oh my god, I just lost ten dollars. Has the thesis changed? Has the thesis changed? Change, the narrative so, yeah. is coming. Everyone's telling you, oh, Apple's sure. a bad stock, etc. Sure. And then you might sell it, or you might keep it, yeah. and you might just hope it goes back up. And then when it goes to 110, you're giving yourself a pat on the shoulder. <laughs> Everyone's telling you it's the greatest trade in the world and sure. you don't want to take it down, right? So you just need to put that's the, that cognitive bias, you need to get rid of it. Yeah. And just automating the whole trading, it, it really helps. So for me, if my model tells me I gotta buy here and sell here, I'm gonna continue doing that. I'm not gonna override it unless I have a really good reason to. Sure. And what that does, I feel, and that's one of the big things for the fund. It, re it really reduces your volatility of returns. Yeah. Because you, you're buying low, you're actually increasing exposure at a low level and you're reducing at a high level. So your drawdowns are lower and your upside's bigger, right? Um, and so I think even just to add to that, uh, even though you can't put a number of this, because people forget, like, you're gonna be doing this day in, day out, weeks, months, years, right? Yeah. So you take out all of the noise otherwise that would come if you didn't have that process, right? Correct. Uh, of should it be now, what's my gut telling me, and so on and so forth. So, right. And that saves you countless invaluable time. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that's one thing. And another, another thing in terms of the investment process is, uh, is the risk management, right? Yes. That goes to the next step. And I think, uh, what we've done is slightly different. Um, you mentioned something that 
I mentioned just now that your, your strategy has to be robust to regime shift. Yes. And that's what our risk management system does. Because when you're in a certain regime, like a low vol regime in 2017, yeah. everything's good, you might lever up because things are great. But if you shift to another regime, that portfolio is going to get destroyed. So what we do is we've studied the correlations across different regimes and how they evolve, and we make sure the portfolio is ready for it, right? And that involves perhaps using options to hedge the portfolio in case you get an event like yeah. we did in Q1 this year. Yeah. But it's just being aware of that. Most people think that the correlations and the volatilities you've seen over the last six, 12 months are going to last, and the risk management systems are built on that. All right, so I, that was a big thing for me when I started the fund. You, if you manage a correlation book, you've been through a few volatility events. You understand <laughs> they change very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So you just need to understand how they change sure. and how those, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think those are the two things, right, that we do slightly differently. Yeah. You know, there's something I've always admired about you, Ash, and, and that's again, you know, this probably is again slotted under the misconceptions that I tend to find is in this business, I guess it's also outside of wealth management, we have this thing in society where everyone loves the idea, you know, so the trade idea, the investment idea, but no one really spends as much time as they should on, as you said, not just even the risk management, but even just the idea construction mm -hmm. and then the actual trading kind of around it, right? Um, and, you know, going back on, as you said, having a core and a trading clip, it also keeps you going through regimes when things are, you know, for instance, when we had gold between 1680 and 1740 for like three, four months, yeah. right? Uh, before it finally kind of broke up higher. And most people would say that money's dead, but actually if you have a core clip and a trading clip, you can actually still be monetizing that. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I've always thought that's the best thing about macro is if you can catch a big trend, it could run for years. And you only need to have one or two of these, and as you said, trade well around them. Uh, yeah. And uh, you actually don't need much more uh, if you get it right. Yeah. And um, how would you, um, characterize um, the, on the capital raising side, uh, I think you have a few different share classes. You have a dollar one, you have a Singapore one, obviously. Um, and then also, I'm a big advocate of skin in the game. Uh, there's a lot of principals out there who have very little money in their fund. Also a lot of CIOs out there who have, CEOs out there who have very little equity in their companies. Um, you know, how much of your family's wealth is, is in AVM? Um, and uh, what are the different kind of tranches and what are the fees versus, uh, versus the industry as well? Yeah, so, I mean... Percentage-wise, obviously. Percentage-wise, yeah. Yeah, 70%, um, yeah, 70 75% of my personal wealth is in there. So the vast majority, yeah. Yeah, you know, if I wasn't running this fund, that's how I'd be running my money. Yeah. So it's perfect for me, right? And I think, you know, I'm thinking long-term. So, yeah, in terms of, like, asset classes, uh, share classes, we have three. There's one for the institutions, yeah. but for, for individual investors, um, we have a Sing dollar share class and the US dollar share class. Yeah. It has a 1% management fee and 20% performance fee. Okay, okay. Yeah. And for the institutional tranche? It's a half a percent yeah. uh, uh, management fees and 20% performance. So how, how scalable is the strategy in the sense of, you know, uh, how much capital can you still uh, get allocated to you and not necessarily change uh, how you're going about your approach? Yeah, um, so we only trade in very liquid markets, so it's highly scalable and it's a low volatility uh, fund, so there isn't too much leverage. So I think this sort of strategy could easily, you know, we're a little over 50 now, I think it could easily get to a billion and there'd be no problem. Okay. Let's maybe uh, touch on, um, as you said, you started November 2016, as I recall, that's I think when we, we first uh, met. Um, walk us through a little bit of, you know, the performance and the journey, both, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the shiny and the gritty. Uh, 2017, which I believe 
you know, was also part of a 15-month consecutive, uh, uh, you know, upside that you fund had, and then maybe also a bit of a drawdown in 2018. Uh, but 2017, very exceptional because I also believe in that year, a lot of the, the macro funds really, really underperformed. And then I'm sure everyone's going to want to hear about how you did at the start of this year, given the difference between Jan and obviously what we saw in February and kind of March. Right? Yeah. Uh, so 2017 uh, was an interesting market. Uh, volatility. We, we'd come into 2017 and, you know, there was synchronized global growth. A lot of it was led by China. Yeah. So, you know, emerging markets in Europe were coming off a tough 2016 and they were starting to grow. So we had, you know, and volatility regime was extremely low, mm -hmm. right? So this is the perfect market to actually play directional views with options. So I was long emerging markets and long Europe by options. Um, and, you know, it was giving you very high risk adjusted returns. And that trend lasted the whole year, something that carried through till December. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it worked out perfectly because whenever there was a, you weren't afraid of the volatility in the market. If there was going to be a drawdown or anything, you had limited loss structures in place through mm -hmm. these options. Yeah. And, you know, it, uh, it really helped because it gets you emotionally ready as well for anything that can go wrong. Um, you know, I just to tell you how cheap options were back then. Yeah, give us some context. Right. So if I bought a 2% out of the money S&P put, yeah. a one month put, it used to cost me 0.3%. Yeah. Right now, that costs you 2%. That's a game changer. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm not sure we're ever going to see that again. You so know, never say 30 never. 30 bips, basically, and Correct. it's 200, right? Correct, wow. yeah. Right. yeah. Never say never, yeah. but, but uh, yeah, it was amazing. So that, you know, so we had a streak of like 14, 15 months uh, uh, positive returns. Um, yeah, so going into 2018. And, and, and on 2017, it was 19% up. 19%. Sharp of five. And I think you outperformed the macro hedge funds by 15% or something of, of, of that mark. And I'm sure no one out there is, is, is flexing sharps of five in the macro <laughs> discretionary space. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I was fortunate. You know, it yeah. was a good start. First year, you must have thought this thing is easy, right? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then uh, 2018? 2018, so, you know, went into the year yeah. looking at the macro data, playing uh, US outperformance, yeah. so, which involved, you know, relative performance with Europe. Um, look, because China has started to step on the brakes, sure. uh, looking at U.S. interest rates going up, as Trump just passed the tax cuts, etc. But 2018 was a year of flash crashes for me, and it was, a, it was a big, you know, it was a learning experience. So what we noticed was, you came out of 2017 this very low vol regime. Yeah, positions were extended. You know, nobody worried too much because you thought you could trade with a lot of liquidity. When we had the first uh, vol shock in February 2018, yeah that really showed us that liquidity disappeared when you needed it the most. And um, you know, what's happened over the last decade is since the GFC, banks have had to step aside from market making. Yeah, and the Volca uh, rules and regulations. Exactly, that, yeah. and then the high frequency guys have come in to take their place. Sure. So during calms of, you know, when it's, when it's calm, it's, it's okay, you know, they're there, they're providing liquidity. Sure. The minute there's a bit of chaos, they disappear. Yeah. So, you know, 2018 for me was really studying the market depth and getting a better understanding of this. Yeah. Because we actually got stopped out of two to three good trades because of the volatility. Gotcha. And gotcha. I have a very strict risk management framework yeah. where, you know, we have to cut our losses. Yeah. Um, so what I understood from that and what we rejigged in 2018 was uh, we started to use options a bit more yeah. to hedge these uh, events because I think it's something that's here to stay as long as the high frequency guys keep taking a bigger market share yeah. in the market making business. So, you know, it costs a little bit more to use options to sort of manage, do the risk management, but it's definitely worth it because you're going to keep seeing this happen again and again, like it did in Q1 this year. Because I think this is something a lot of people and even, you know, so-called professionals in, in, in the markets don't appreciate because when banks were market making a lot more and also having the ability to, to run profit positions, but they were also obligated to make markets. And a lot of these high frequency guys and gals mm -hmm. are not right so they completely disappear only take one side that they want yeah. uh, when uh, you know things hit the fan so to speak right that's right um, so yeah no, it's, it, it's it's a really key structural big difference I think that sure. um, is not appreciated go on yeah yeah so then you know getting into 2019 with the rejigged uh, risk management framework uh, so for the last I'd say two years 18 months yeah. it's, been, it's been it's been pretty good so we went into 2019 uh, 
position for lower growth. Um, it was positioning for the Fed and other central banks to cut interest rates, so we had long duration, long government bonds that played out well till uh, Q3. And then you started to see things get a bit more constructive. Mm. So China had been slowing for a while, they have been doing fiscal stimulus, and you notice that data in North Asia started to improve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was my first step back into getting into equities again in North Asia, China, Korea, uh, Taiwan. Um, and that was working out well in Q4. Yeah. Right? And going into January this year, I was quite bullish. Phase one deal coming up, liquidity was flush, they just cut interest rates, right, because they started QE again. Correct. Um, yeah. And uh, economic data was improving, right? Profits were growing. And uh, going, so, you know, it just goes back to the risk management framework. So when I look at my portfolio, I need to see where the tail risks are, mm. right? You need to understand that things are looking rosy, what happens if things change? Mm -hmm. So I put it through a scenario analysis and I noticed that uh, one of the tail risks for me was a black swan event, a, t a meltdown in markets, mm -hmm. right? I didn't believe it was gonna happen. I didn't see what was gonna happen. Yeah. But you know, I just bought some cheap options because yeah. options were cheap that no one wanted to hedge anything. Everyone thought- And this is the whole point of tail risks. You don't want them to happen, right? Correct, but yeah. you do still hedge, right? right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I bought some cheap puts on cheap. the S&P just yeah. as a macro hedge for the whole portfolio. Correct. And uh, yeah, you know, China shuts down, locks down the 23rd of January, right? Yes. And uh, things changed. And yeah. so for, with me, first thing I did was ask everyone around, like doctors, people, on, uh, sure. people in China, what was going on. And I realized that, okay, a one month lockdown in China, second biggest economy in the world, growth is not gonna keep going up, right? Yeah. So I got rid of all my, sorry, cyclical exposures in North, North Asia, and I decided to, get a bit more duration, more bonds in there, because slowing growth means you want to be long government bonds. Yeah. I didn't take off my equity puts because I didn't know how bad this could get. Correct. And in February, when you saw how bad it spread in China, yeah. I started to get a bit more bearish, but you know, still hadn't hit, still not as bearish because people in Europe and the US. It was a, there was a real disconnect, right? It's people were kind of acting like it's just those crazy people in yeah. Asia who eat bats or whatever yeah. it was right. that was saying. And I, I, again, I was like, yeah, I was just a, a bit kind of, you know, gobsmacked, to right. be honest, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, being here, we were lucky because we see we saw it firthand, right? Yes, and, and we've had SARS here before as well, right? Exactly, yeah. and uh, you know, you talk to your counterparts in like, um, in Europe and the US, they were like, nothing's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right up to the end of Feb. And um, when I noticed, what I noticed is, because you can also, I, I do keep track of positioning data. Sure. So I pay for that to just see how the markets are generally positioned. And the biggest tail risk in the market, we had the highest positioning in equities mm. in the last 10 years in February after we had a lockdown in China, gotcha. which, you know, so that was a bit of a disconnect, yeah, right? The yeah, risk was yeah. there. Yeah. So once they uh, had the first few cases in New York and it started becoming a problem, yeah. that's when I started getting bearish. So when I look at uh, regimes, I felt there was a high chance we were going into a deleveraging regime. Yeah. In that situation, nothing goes up except the US dollar. Right, so I shifted my portfolio from constructive in January, defensive in uh, February, and so March I went to the deleveraging. Right, so I was long the U.S. dollar, yeah. short the S&P. I left my puts there. Yeah, it was the best ten basis points I ever I spent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then also the structuring of that, right? Because being directional short on equities is it's it's really tough uh, over extended periods of time to hold it. Right? Yeah, yeah, because. You know, the, what I noticed was the liquidity again, right? Yes. So I think the move in March was not fundamentals. Yeah. It was more liquidity. People needed to get out, and there was no liquidity. Yeah. The liquidity in S&P futures and Treasury futures were 5% of the regular liquidity, right? So you imagine these big multi-billion dollar hedge yeah. funds that need yeah. to liquidate. And that's, that's why we had the moves that we had in March, basically. Correct, right? correct. And you know, um, so my idea there, because I'm always putting my por portfolio based on regimes, right? Yeah. So when I was short there, I told myself the minute the Fed comes out, because it's a liquidity problem to me, mm. it wasn't the virus, yeah. right? People were getting out. Yeah. So I said, when the Fed comes out and backstops the treasury market, I'm gonna reverse my positions. Gotcha. Right, so they came out third week of uh, March. I think it started on the 18th and they kept announcing stuff for a month. Yeah. But they backstopped the treasury markets first. Yeah. And that was the spot when vol started to collapse in the treasury markets yeah. and I went long duration there. Yeah. And then they said they're going to backstop corporate bonds. So I started buying investment grade bonds in the US. Yeah. Then they said they're going to backstop mortgage bonds, mortgage securities, I bought those. So you basically, the idea was to 
front run the Fed. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I still remember, and they were really quick, because I remember you and I talking about like credit is next on the weekend, yeah. and we still thought it was maybe two weeks, and it ended up being the Monday that, that opened up, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think you know you know how they react. Yeah. The central banks are going to come in and stabilize markets, right? Yeah. So you want to be with them. You know, don't fight the Fed, sure. as people say. Sure. So yeah, then we wrote that uh, over March, April, and May. You know, there were a bit of divergences. You could you were still short EM, short oil, going through that period, but you're getting more constructive on yeah. bonds, for example. So I think it was just the framework. You know, just sticking to the game. I didn't do anything differently in this year than I would have done last year. Yeah. It's just knowing what regime you're in and what you need to trade. Okay. Awesome, awesome. And snapshot in regards to kind of performance, how has the fund done from inception to date and, and how are you doing this year? So this year we're up about 9.5% to 10% yeah. so far. Yeah, so as we're talking, we're about to go into the fourth quarter, right? That's so 9.5% right. uh, percent so yeah. far this year. And, and if I'd put in uh, uh, some of the family jewels from, from the inception of the fund, uh, what would we be talking about be the return so far? Yeah, you'd be up about 40 plus percent. About 40 percent. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. Not too shabby and low vol at that, right? Uh, which I believe is also mandated, as you said, by the structure of your fund, right? That's right. So the volatility yeah. in the fund is about five and a half percent. I yeah. want to keep it below eight. Yeah. But at five and a half, since the inception of the fund, it's actually even lower than government bonds. <laughs> <laughs> and with a better risk profile, probably from a, a balance sheet perspective. That's right. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, I guess just to just to to get towards kind of wrapping this up, Ash. Uh, you know, when we're kind of sitting here, it's dynamic. It, in many ways, it's a world we've never seen. If if people are really being honest, um, and um, my viewpoint has always been, there's always opportunities, obviously. But what's kind of top of minds? We obviously have this U.S. election, which everyone is basically consensus about. At least is a feeling that it's going to be super contested. Uh, who could win, you know, versus implications of, let's say, the broader regime that we're in. Uh, you know, what are two, three things that are top of mind to you as we kind of look towards going into end of uh, 2020, still a, a full quarter and a little bit above us? Uh, we've obviously had a Fed that has said they're going to be on the sidelines uh, for three years, so all the way till, you know, 2023. And, um, you know, how are you kind of thinking in regards to 2021, uh, if, if, if anything, just. Yeah, I think, you know, this is going to be an interesting period, the next two to three years, um, maybe the next 10 years. So what we've seen uh, with this pandemic is, uh, you know, that central banks have done what they usually do. They come in, they, they, they add a lot of liquidity, they backstop the markets. But the first, for the first time, now we've got fiscal stimulus, mm. right, at full throttle. Yeah. And the amount of stimulus they've done like three to four months in the past like well, six months now um, it's just amazing right and this time the central banks are going to support them right so they're working together we've never had two of them working together correct. for a long time correct yeah that's a very very powerful combo yeah so i think i'm pretty constructive on risk because i think what's going to happen as you mentioned is no central bank is going to raise interest rates for a while if inflation's not there so there's going to be a lot of liquidity. There's going to be a lot of borrowing from governments. And, you know, I think a lot of that will, maybe that's exactly what we need to get out of this deflation trap or the secular stagnation trap. Sure. Right? You know, you have demographics, you have technological advances. That's been keeping inflation down. But with fiscal stimulus at the forefront now, I think that could drive demand up. And that could maybe bring some growth and in inflation back to the game. So with that in mind, I, I you know, I'm pretty constructive in risk going into 21, 22. Sure. You know, the minute we get a, we get a home, we have some control in this pandemic. You know, people are looking at the vaccine, but I'm thinking more. Even if we don't get that, we'll get a lot of testing, which is happening right now. Herd immunity. Herd immunity. So on, yeah. So we're going to get past this, I believe, next year. Yeah. Things are going to get better regardless of whether we get a vaccine. That's my opinion. Sure. And with that support from fiscal and monetary. It's going to be a very strong force to drive growth and risky assets higher. Now, there's no free lunch. You can't just have unlimited uh, fiscal, unlimited monetary policy. Someone has to lose, right? Sooner or later, I guess, yes. Yeah, so to me, the losers are going to be the guys holding onto debt issued by these highly indebted uh, countries, right? Okay. So if you're holding U.S. Treasuries, you're holding bonds, you're holding all these, you're going to be losing out, either because interest rates go up or mm -hmm. their currencies go down. Mm -hmm. And that's why, for me, a structural U.S. dollar short is there. You know, a lot of people want to buy the euro against the U.S. dollar. 
I'm just short your reserve currencies, and especially the euro and the dollar. Sure. And you buy something elsewhere, they don't have the same issue, right? Okay. So I think structurally, the reserve currency, the debt of these reserve currencies are going to go down. Yeah. Either interest rates go up, yeah. or uh, the currencies go down. Okay. Okay. Um, any uh, other comments on on COVID in general? Like, uh, are we are we even going to be talking about this three years from now? You know, there's a lot of people out there say it's never going to be the same again. Uh, people never get on planes again, and so on and so forth. I was just wondering if, if you if you have any other views on that. No, I think people love their holidays too much, man. Yeah. <laughs> I heard uh, people booking their carnival trips already yeah. on the cruise lines. And um, one thing I wanted to ask you on, um, and uh, you know, Abe re- resignation third quarter, 2020. To me, I- I'm never one that's big on anecdotal readings into kind of events, but I think this one's very different. Like, you know, I think of him as Godzilla exiting the building, literally, because of just the the force of nature. He has been kind of, you know, the equivalent of a modern day shogun in Japan. And during his era, you know, you were managing options desk from this, from Abenomics kicked off back end of 2012. Dollar yen went from 77, 78 to 125, 126. Mm -hmm. We're kind of around 106, 107 levels as, as we're filming this. Um, obviously, the Nikkei went up about 180% during that period. We got inflation and growth back in Japan. And more interestingly to me, the Bank of Japan's balance sheet went from 30% of GDP to rounding off, you could say it's 120% of right. GDP now. And I think this is kind of fascinating from a potential end game when you look at the Fed, the US, the ECB, and, and, and the Eurozone. Um, and, you know, a lot of read across from that, but let's just stick with dollar yen. You know, from my perspective, I think the highs in dollar yen are, are, are in, and we probably see, you know, sub 100, maybe high 90s before the end of the year, and maybe back end of 2021, kind of that 85 to 95 range. And it also gels quite well with also me being a, a mega, you know, US dollar bear. Um, and the icing on the cake is, it is also a bit of a, hedge if we do have some fallout in the U.S. elections. Uh, I was just curious what you thought about dollar yen. Uh, I know you, you, you love to get on a plane to Japan back on uh, pre-COVID and, and, and get up on some slopes and, and have some kind of good sushi. Uh, but any kind of views on, on, on dollar yen or Japan or even anything else in this region for, for, for one reason or another? Yeah, I think, um, you know, they did a lot. They were the first ones out there. The yeah. was huge, and you know they grew their balance sheet. They really tried to devalue their currency. One thing about Japan is that uh, they have a very high current account surplus mm-hmm. because their international investment position is quite big, Correct. right? So you know maybe their trade balance depends where oil is is quite flat, but the investment returns are quite high. So there's always going to be demand for yen, right? To counter that, what they do is they keep recycling their money overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think when it comes to this whole MMT or whatever, right, however you want to call it, the combo of fiscal and monetary, Japan's been doing it for a long time. They're way ahead of the game compared to Europe, yeah. compared to the US, right? Yeah. So you've seen they had to step away from it. Well, everyone's trying to increase QE. They stopped, they reduced it starting in 2016, 17, when they did yield curve control, yeah. right? Because they realized it made no difference anymore. Right? <laughs> So when it comes to balance sheet expansion, I think you're going to see the other guys expand their balance sheets a lot faster than Japan. Yeah. Right. So there is, if you look at the yen versus the dollar, I do think the trend is downwards. Yeah. Um, maybe the yen gets some benefit from China being the engine of growth going forward the next three to four years. China is really outperforming, you know, globally. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, I think the trend is downwards, and it also gives you that risk-off exposure. So for a short dollar perspective for me, I think having something like the yen as part of your basket makes a lot of sense. Perfect. Ashvin, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for making the time.